I'm not going to debate what is correct, but anyway, I will. As in, when you're in Rome, do as the Romans do. So, can you imagine the situation? What? It warrants total depression. The circulation of the assassination of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, apparent victory turning into failure. You see people that are fans of any soccer and cricket, when they lose that match, they've, what happens to them? People can't sleep. Some people that are watching, they want to break the screen on the TV. This is the depression that people go through. They become so obsessed. I don't know if the word obsessed just defines what people, what attachment people have with these games and their fans. And that fan doesn't know you, nor he, does he know about your existence. For whom you're giving your life. And Prophet Muhammad Sassam gave his entire life for you. And you still feel ashamed to reflect his teachings? His night and day was one. He cried for me and you. In Mi'raj it was you and I, the male and the females of this Ummah. And yet you suffer a complex looking like a believer? In the midst of the ferocious battle, where Sahaba lost their composure, the Quran says, ثُمَّ أَنزَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ الْغَمِّ أَمَنَةً نُعَاسَا يَغْشَى طَائِفَةً مِّنْكُمْ وَطَائِفَةٌ قَدْ أَهَمَّتْهُمْ أَنفُسُهُمْ يَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ In the midst of the battle, while this happened, Allah says, I send down divine sleep. Azad Zubair radiallahu anhu says, we were holding our swords and we fell off to sleep in the battle. Subhanallah. When Allah wants to give it, in the midst of the ferocious battle, staring at the kafir, while the sword is in you and they fall off to sleep. And your man sitting in the comfort of, of, of the best of luxury, he cannot sleep. He says, and I can hear, while we sleep in the sword is falling off my hand. And I can hear the munafiqeen saying, Hallana min al amri min shay. Hallana min al amri min shay. You see, contentment comes from Allah. Two people are sleeping on one bed in one room, in one house, partnership. One has it, one Allah has snatched it away. The munafiqeen were also in this battle, but they came with ulterior motives. They also seen this here. But this divine sleep and slumber only came on the believers. And Allah deprived the munafiqeen of it because their participation in the battle was with ulterior motives. Hence, the thing I'm stressing and harping from is that this contentment comes divine from Allah and it comes on total adherence and, and total compliance to the dictates of Shariat. So, what happens? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says, An nu'asu fil qitali min Allah, wa nu'asu fi salati min al shaytan. That sleep in the battle is a sign of victory and is from Allah. And sleep in salah is from shaitan. You fall off to sleep, you know, don't, don't think that is, you know, divine tranquility coming from, you know. <laughs> like one brother told me, you know, in salah, a person is, is busy planning haram. He's owing someone money. He's planning how he's going to not pay his creditors. He thinks up a plan and then he says, Subhanallah, namaz is so wonderful. You know, Allah gave me such a thought. <laughs> Allah gave me such a thought in salah. One brother told me, he says, Malana, I have a problem. I said, what's your problem? He says, in Salah, I think of my wife a lot. So I told him, brother, you are lucky. Most of the people think of other people's wives. you lucky, carry on. <laughs> I said, Wallah, you are lucky. And I say it again. Wallah, I say it again. That's not the ideal thing. You should be thinking of Allah. But if in Salah, you think of your own wife, you're a lucky man today. Ask 80%, they are not thinking of their own wife. They're thinking of strange woman. If you think of your own wife, Mubarak to you in your thoughts. <laughs> Wish you well in your endeavors. Allah gave them sleep. It was a period of time. And he says, and then we got up. We got up, we had our act together. We had, we had our composure. And once again, we launched an attack. Hence, my brothers, in the midst of such challenges, Allah gave them peace. Let me come with the incident of Ayyub alayhi salam and we bring it to the culmination. Ayyub alayhi salatu was salam. This is what happens, that in this situation, seven years pass, it continues. After a period of time, it comes to 13 years. On the author of Anas radiallahu anhu, one day a devil comes. Again, what, what are the options being presented? Take this and you'll be happy. Drive, drive this car. And you know the, 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 the advertisements, the ideal couple. 
husband and wife with broad smiles and a child walking through a marketplace. And, you know, the clothing is so beautiful. The boat are slim and attractive. Such a beautiful, you know, no problems. What, what a unique, ideal picture. That couple doesn't exist but on pictures. There's no couple like that in life. So anyway, the devil came to the wife of Ayub والسلام, in a disguised form, in a form of a doctor. And she says, I will cure your husband. Again, what, what, what temptations there are to satisfy you? You got this bank balance, you got this bank offer, you got this loan, you can do this with your money, you can go to this place for holiday and vacation. And it's so soothing and it's so nice and so promising. So the devil came and the devil told the wife of Ayub السلام, that I will cure your husband. The only thing I need is that after I have cured him, you must acknowledge me. Nothing more. You must say, I really appreciated you that you have cured my husband. Perhaps given the desperation of this woman, she did not fully fathom the implications of the statement. And she said, okay, if that's the case, I'll do it. You know, I'm desperate for cure. When a person is desperate for, for cure, he will travel anywhere and do anything. And many a times we don't realize we step outside the boundaries of permissibility also. <coughs> she happily came to her spouse and she said, Ayyub, the matter has been resolved. I met with a doctor and he's promised to cure you and he only wants that I must acknowledge him. But subhanallah, a Nabi is not oblivious of Allah at any point in his life. He gets up and he tells his wife that I am the sick one. I am suffering, but I am content. Why are you becoming restless? That was the devil that came to you. Do you know that statement is tantamount to kufr? Because you are attributing the quality of cure which is exclusive to Allah, to the creation of Allah. Now, for a person who is desperate himself to utter that is not easy. Sayyidina Sulaiman is in the midst of affluence. In a state of ecstasy, a person forgets his position. Ecstasy and sadness. A person generally trespasses beyond the, the limits of Sharia. Sayyidina Sulaiman, the entire throne of Bilqis is brought. What authority, what power, what kingdom, what might? But when he seen what authority Allah had endowed him with, what a vast kingdom, immediately he said, this is the sheer mercy of my Allah that he's favored me with such a dominion. And this is out of his kindness and nothing out of my own intellect. Sayyidina Ayyub والسلام, says that was the statement of the kafir, of shaitan. And I don't want him. But because of the statement that you have made, if I ever recover from my sickness, I'm going to give you a hundred lashes. Now yesterday we had a little discussion. Shaykh Riyad was speaking about you know, family problems and that. Look at this situation. How today trivial things are creating depression in our life. And hear how Allah is favoring them. What a challenge is in their life, but look at how they react. Time carries on. Someone makes a statement. Some two people, this riwayat comes in, Musnad Ahmad, who are very close to Ayyub alayhi salam. One of them made a statement that I think that Ayyub is suffering so much because he has really done something wrong in his life. Well, ayyadu billah, that we become judgmental on the tragedies of others. Let us never become judgmental. Whenever you see a young boy doing something wrong, he's involved with some haram, Allah be my witness. I have said this before and I said, I try my level best. Come home, perform turakat salah, make dua to Allah Ta'ala, not speak about it to anyone else. Whenever you meet him, speak to him, make dua and encourage him. Today it's him, I have children, you have children. Until and unless, this ummah will not embrace every child. And until and unless, we will not make our contribution to this particular institution. Even after my children leave from here, then we are here for the ummah and not for selfish reasons. That father who resigns from a committee after his son has left, he was there for personal reasons. This ummah is a selfless nation, not a selfish nation. So when Ayyub heard this, he felt very hurt. He said, Allah, you have tested me. I have persevered. I am happy. I am content. But if this is the notion of people that I'm suffering because I have done wrong, then I implore you make instant decisions of my cure. 
Make a decision now of my if, if this is the perception of people. Allah responded immediately. Inna wajadna hu sabiran ni'mal abdu inna hu awab. Inna wajadna hu sabiran ni'mal abdu inna hu awab. We found him to be very patient. We found Ayyub to be very patient. Allah said, Urkudh bi rijlika hadha mughtasalun baridun wa sharab. Strike your heel on the ground. Strike your heel, water will gush out. Drink from the water, all your internal sicknesses are cured. Bath in the water, all your external sicknesses are cured. He drinks from the water in the riwayat of Ibn Abi Hatim. Allah sends down a garment of Jannah. He is internally, externally cured. Allah restores his youth to him. He dresses the garment of Jannah and he sits there. His wife returns. She cannot identify. She comes to this young, handsome, attractive. Imagine you come home and your wife is 20 years younger. Allahu Akbar. The desire of every man. <laughs> and same thing for the woman. I mean, she would say same thing that uh, you come home and you find subhanallah. And that she's gone so much more younger. But this is when contentment comes from Allah. In, in, that, in, that, in that challenge also. In that difficulty also there was happiness. There was tranquility. So she comes to him and she asks him. Ain al -mubtala alladhi kana ha huna. Sorry, uh, you mind me asking you. There was an elderly sick aged person here. Uh, do you know who he is? So she, he smiles and he says, now, do you know my wife? I am that, I am your husband, I am Ayyub. So, you know, like they say sometimes, too nice to be true. You know? Uh, I, 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 I would be too happy to have it, but it sounds too nice for it to be too true. He then narrates the incident. They embrace one another and they thank Allah. Immediately he now recalls that I had taken a qasam that I have to lash my wife hundred times. Now one side, he doesn't want to violate his oath. At the same time, the loyalty of this partner. She stood as a pillar of support in days of difficulty and hardship. So Allah makes divine intervention in the matter. Allah makes divine concession in the matter. Not in any hadith, kitab, in the Quran. Allah says, وَخُذْ بِيَدِكَ ضِغْثًا فَضْرِبْ بِهِ وَلَا تَحْنَثْ وَخُذْ بِيَدِكَ ضِغْثًا فَضْرِبْ بِهِ وَلَا تَحْنَثْ O Ayyub, I acknowledge the contribution and the moral support of your wife. You're not going to lash her. And neither are you going to violate your oath. You leave it to me, I make intervention. You go and look for a bundle of grass, which has hundred straws of grass in it. And then you touch her once and that's lashing a hundred times. Ibn Kathir rahmatullahi says, وَهَذَا مِنَ الْفَرَجْ وَالْمَخْرَجْ لِمَنِ اتَّقَ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَلَا سِيَّمَا فِي إِمْرَأَتِهِ الصَّابِرَةِ الْبَارَّةِ الرَّاشِدَةِ وَلِهَذَا عَقَّبَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَى بِقَوْلِهِ That this intervention and concession that Allah made for this woman was because she stood as a pillar of support and she stood content, she stood happy that what my Allah has decreed in our life between myself and my husband and my children, whatever my Allah has put out, I am happy. As a result of her contentment and her moral support, this was the divine intervention and concession that Allah made in the matter. I leave you with one brief incident and make dua to the Almighty Allah that He inspires this contentment in both myself and you and the entire Muslim Ummah. The entire world is desperate for contentment. Travel throughout America and North America. Wallah, more desperate than the people living in abject poverty for food is the people living in this part of the world for contentment. They are more desperate for it than those living desiring bread and water. There is nothing. They have tried it in this. They have tried it in that. In music, in women, in clubs, in, in scenic views, there is nothing. Allah, behold, beware. Bi dhikrillahi tatma'innul qulub. It is the remembrance of Allah that brings joy to the heart. Now there are two things. One is Allah says the remembrance of Allah brings joy. Naturally the reverse meaning will be nothing else brings joy. When Allah's remembrance brings joy, nothing, nothing but uh, nothing else can bring joy. There was an article that I read on a particular masjid board and I leave you with this. Sayyidillu ibratil liman arada an yadhakkara aw arada shukura. A father comes home, tired and exhausted, in the crave of materialism, blinded by money, more, 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 just trying to amass and amass and amass, accumulate more and more, N nothing more. You know, this is the crave that has just engulfed every person. 
نبي عليه السلام said for والله ما الفقر أخشى عليكم ولكنني أخشى أن تبسط عليه he had sent Abu Ubaidah to Bahrain to collect some money so when Abu Ubaidah came back from Bahrain and he came with the money to Medina Sahaba heard that he has returned with money the next morning all of them came in red fajr there in Medina next to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فوافو صلاة الفجر مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم after fajr فتعرضوا له they all started you know coming forward and presenting themselves so Nabi alayhi wa sallam sensed that أظنكم أنكم سمعتم أن أبا عبيد قدم بمال من البحرين Nabi alayhi wa sallam says it looks like the news has traveled that Abu Ubaidah came with some money and you people have gathered here and the sense of jubilation that I see is in relation to your expectations. They said, yes, O Nabi of Allah, we got nothing to hide. You, you've read the matter as it is. Nabi alayhi salam said, well and good to you and uh, may, may Allah give you the wealth you want. I have it here and may Allah give you barakat in it also. But while the opportunity has presented, let me seize the opportunity and tell you, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا الْفَقْرَ أَخْشَى عَلَيْكُمْ وَلَكِنَّنِي أَخْشَى أَن تُبْسَتَ عَلَيْكُمْ الدُّنْيَا كَمَا بُسِتَتْ عَلَى مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ May Allah give you and may He give you barakat. But this is not my fear whether you have it or not. My fear is when you have too much of it. I fear the other extreme when Allah opens it so much. And that becomes the aim of this ummah, the night and the day, the morning and the evening, the, the young and the old, the male and the female. And then you make this the reason that when buying a car, you don't look at comfort, but you look at a car that will give you a name in society. Drive this car, people will look towards you. Wear this clothing, people will admire you. When the grounds of selecting a car will be to earn and secure a name in society, then I fear, O oh my nation, fatuhlikakum kama ahlakatum. It will destroy you like how it destroyed the nations that preceded you. When that becomes the goal of this ummah, yati ala nasi zamanun himamuhum butunuhum sharafuhum mataahuhum qiblatuhum nisaahuhum dinuhum darahimuhum wadananiruhum ulaika shirarul khalq. But there's no joy end of the day. You have everything. Talabna thalatha. We are searching for three, but we are looking in the wrong place. Talabna al-mal. Talabna al-mal. Talabna al-ghina fi al-mal. Talabna al-ghina. Talabna al-raha fi al-kathra fa idha hiya fi al-qilla. We were searching for luxury in comfort. Talabna al-raha fi al-kathra. We thought the more we will have, the more happy we will be. But actually it's the less that you have. The less that you have. You don't see a person coming out at an airport who just have hand luggage. He's got less. He's going out better. He's more happy. The others are carrying so much, but they're more frustrated. Those that have more, are in, they are more worried, they are more tense. The one that has nothing is going so nice, sailing, one way through. وَتَلَبْنَ الْكَرَامَ فِي الْخَلْقِ And we search for honor in the creation, but it is with Allah. So anyway, this father came home. His son said, Daddy, can I speak to you today for two minutes? Listen to this, brothers. I need your undivided attention. I've been saying many things with regards to contentment across the hour that I've been speaking to you. <coughs> Dad, can I speak to you for two minutes? Okay, quickly talk. When I'm busy, I've got to sign documents. I've got some goods coming. I just need to know, how, how, how much do you earn per hour? Look, look, what's wrong with you? Why do you want to know how much I earn per hour? What has that got to go do your work, man? Dad, I'm asking nicely, how much do you earn? To make you happy, I earn $20 an hour. Okay. Could you perhaps be kind enough to borrow me $10? No. Every time I'm giving you money, it's enough, man. Go from here. Gives him one slap and sends him off to sleep. The son goes away, father is tired. There was another youngster came to my house. He was depressed, I promise you. One young boy came to my house one day, he asked me, Molana, do you have a dua for depression? I looked at this boy, I said, my boy, do you know what does depression mean? A boy at your age, 10 years old, do you know what is depression? This was, a, this was another incident, a fairly grown up youngster, must be in his 20s. He came to me, these were his words, he had some problems in his life. He says, my mother is terminally ill. I can't talk to her because she is very sick. My father is a stressed individual. These were his words. My father is a stressed. There's no way I can take out time and engage in a healthy discussion. You know, fatherly to son, the dad, these are the problems. Can we negotiate? Can we sit down? Can I have some input? Can we reasonably address the matters at hand? I need some input. I need some advice. My father is a stressed individual. Now, what happens to this young boy who is vulnerable to vices? His parents cannot take him. The mother terminally ill. Tragically, this has happened, which happens in all families. The father, because of the mountain pressure of his business circle and because of the crave of materialism, which has blinded him. 
Anyway, the boy goes and he says, well, that's it, he goes to sleep. As the night sets in and regret dawns upon the father, he says, no, I think I was rude to my son. I don't think it was right. He comes and he taps his son. He taps his son. Subhanallah, it brings tears to my eyes. He wakes him. My son, what's it, my son? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was tired and you came to me at the wrong time. Forgive me for what I did. But what is it? What do you need? Ten dollars. Here's it, my baby. Have it. So the father takes out a ten dollar, gives it to him. He lifts his pillow. He has another ten dollar there. The father says, but my beloved, you have ten dollars. I mean, I'm happy to give you. Why do you want it? He says, Dad, it's been months, if not years. I haven't sat with you. I haven't eaten with you. I know money means everything to you. I thought I will save up money to buy one hour so that I can eat with you. I haven't eaten with you. I haven't seen my father. I'm living like an orphan in this house. And I know till you don't make your money, you won't come home. So I've been saving up money and I thought if I can just get that other ten dollars and perhaps try and, you know, attract you with that and say that dad, here's a twenty dollar, please come home early tomorrow. We want to have supper together. It was enough for that father to be reduced to emotions and sentiments. He sold that business. But really, brothers, let us take this message to heart. What good is there in that wealth? If it has deprived us of our social life, if it has deprived us of our life with Allah, may Allah Ta'ala favor myself and one and all with divine contentment that we have enough time for both deen and dunya. May Allah Ta'ala inspire us with the true tranquility which He has promised in Quran and Hadith. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Appearance reminds you about Allah. His external appearance, the manner in which He presents before you reminds you of Allah. I think the first point was taken and was quite well absorbed and understood. And when he speaks, when he articulates, when he mentions, then your knowledge of Allah, your consciousness of Allah Ta'ala increases. And the third point, which perhaps was ambiguous or vague, which the brother has asked about, his actions, his display, uh, the manner in which he conducts himself reminds you about Akhirah. How conscious he is, how meticulous he is, the manner in which he conducts himself, his honesty, his integrity, uh, the fact that he is conscious of accountability. If a person lives a life, you know, with no scruples, with no values, with no morals, then uh, this is a clear reflection that he is he is not conscious of the perception of accountability. Allah Ta'ala says with regards to those that cheat in their dealings, Allah Yadun that because they cheat and they commit the act of fraud in their dealings, immediately the Quran goes on to say, after cursing them, woe be to those who deal in fraud. Are they unaware that they will be resurrected? When humanity in its entirety will converge and will be accountable to Allah Ta'ala. So the third point in the hadith, perhaps if I may explain it again, is that this person's actions reminds his friends of Akhirah. Uh, the manner in which he interacts with his friends and with his colleagues reminds you of Akhirah. The next question was also with, rel uh, with uh, relevance to the topic on, on friends and befriending. What if I have my friends that I grew up with all my life, but they are not pious? Do I severe ties with them or isn't it wise? And perhaps this is answering the question himself. Or isn't it wise to be friends uh, to be friends with them and help them to choose the right path. Many of the youth are facing these adversities. Sheikh, I want your honest opinion, and instead of creating enmity, it could guide us in the correct way. I think the point the brother has raised is very relevant and very topical, and it is a dilemma that many youth face. Uh, of course, the question is how much spirituality that each person has uh, in, in, in impressing uh, that and transmitting that very piety onto others. Of course, that is our duty as Muslims that we become conscious of Allah Ta'ala, we become pious, and we transmit that spirituality onto others. Uh, this is the ultimate goal and, and, and object that should be in the life of every person. But more than often we find in situations like this, we get sucked and pulled in that environment and we get influenced instead of influencing. It is well and said and done. Uh, it sounds very rosy and theoretically, I think everyone would agree. And that would be the ideal situation, ideal situation that yes, you could perhaps go there and take them out of that evil, introduce them to the correct without it influencing on you. 
But like it is always said that when you sit with them and you associate with them, then some influence of that definitely rubs onto you. So I think uh, it's not a general ruling that should be, you know, advocated that severe ties or maintained ties. I think every situation's got to be identified independently. And if a person uh, can see he has friends, and alhamdulillah, gradually he is working on them, and they are bringing about a change, and he is starting to interact with good friends, and uh, you know, by him uh, socializing with them, and uh, them getting exposed to his reformation in life, is bringing about a change in them, so why not? Gradually bring them into the company of the pious with whom you associate, and like you know, the question phrases it very well that if you severe, the chances of them going deeper into sin is there. So naturally, that is not the object, but at the same time, not at the expense of sacrificing one's own reformation. Uh, more than often, we find a person sits with those that smoke and he starts smoking. A person uh, you know, goes out with friends uh, that womanizes and he perpetrates the same crime. So if, if he could bring them into good environment and keep contact with them on occasions where he understands he is not that vulnerable, then by all means, by all means, and that should be ideal but not at the cost of sacrificing his own reformation. Of course, this, this question could, 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 you know, there could be much more that could be said, but just briefly, that is what I would like to contribute. The third question asked here is, and very briefly we're running through them. <clears throat> you mentioned in your talk that a father has absolute access. Uh, I think again, like uh, you know, Dr. Munir al Qasi mentioned, again, it's a choice of words which uh, perhaps give off a certain notion and perception but nonetheless, your talk, you mention in your talk that a father has absolute access to his son's wealth. In the case where a father demands access to wealth, but the wealth is abused, that is wasted on gambling, is it still sinful for the son to refuse giving the wealth? Jazakallah khair for your talk and guidance. Uh, you know, the hadith of Nabi alayhi salatu was salam, we know, la ta'ata li makhluqin fi ma'asiyatil khaliq. There is no obedience to the creation at the cost of the displeasure and the disobedience of the creator. I think this is uh, a s quite basic and simple that uh, that uh, assist in matters of good and do not assist in matters of evil. Uh, as obligated and as dutiful we are to our parents in matters uh, that conform with Shariat. Uh, that particular Sahabi, Sa'ad radiallahu anhu, after accepting Islam, and his mother vowed not to eat, nor drink, nor sleep, nor rest until her son abandons Islam. Subsequently, the verses were revealed. And subhanallah, in the Quran, in the most eloquent, comprehensive, yet voluminous description of the Quran, وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ لِتُشْرِكَ بِهِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٌ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا Which is a very clear-cut verse of the Quran, that if they compel you to shirk, to polytheism, to any act of disobedience, then do not obey them in that particular matter. However, this doesn't give a general ruling of becoming, you know, rebelling against your parents. وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا Be kind and loyal and faithful and dutiful and politely decline, respect their difference, but do not uh, comply to their dictates with regards to the disobedience of Allah. So naturally, if a person knows that he, a, father, a son knows that the father is, is asking for wealth and the father is abusing the wealth, even in the event if the father is not asking wealth from the son, but the son knows that the father out of his own earnings or wherever he's getting wealth, he's abusing the wealth in gambling, it would be the duty of the son to make efforts to gu guide the father, to direct the father, of course with diplomacy and with wisdom, and it would not be correct. It would not be correct for that son to give the father, knowing very well if the father is going to abuse the wealth. In fact, it can be safely said that at that time the command of Allah would be to refuse. At that time the command of Allah would be to refuse uh, because knowing very well the person is going to abuse the wealth, and that is exactly what Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam said, man ahabba lillah wa abghadha lillah wa a'ta lillah wa mana'a lillah faqad istakmal al-iman. You know, very comprehensive hadith of Nabi alayhi salam, he who loves for the pleasure of Allah and dislikes for the pleasure of Allah. At times, dislike, hatred, on the name of Allah. Abdullah ibn Mukhaffar radiallahu anhu told his son, uh, told his nephew that, you know, you throw in the stone like that. Nabi alayhi salam said, inna la yaqtulu sayyid, uh, using the stone, you know, aiming it at someone is not going to kill the game or the animal. Yafqa'ul ayn, it will injure someone's eye, yaksiru sin, perhaps it will break a tooth or more. 
Uh, and few, you know, some days later, he finds his nephew using the stone in the very same way that the Nabi of Allah had pr prohibited. So he says, uh, you know, وَحَدِّثُكَ أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ نَهَا عَنِ الْخَزَفْ ثُمَّ عُدْتَ تَخْزِفْ وَاللَّهِ لَا أُكَلِّمُكَ أَبَدَا I am telling you that the Nabi of Allah has reprimanded and prohibited. You ignore the consequences and the warnings and yet you persist in doing this. I swear by Allah, I will never speak to you. So displeasure and anger on the name of Allah is also desired and required and it is matloob. You know, there are many verses of the Quran where Allah Ta'ala speaks about that also. And to give on the name of Allah where Allah exhorts us and encourages us. And to withhold and to refuse and to hold back. Uh, and, and that is exactly the difference between tabdeer and israf. Inna al-mubadhireena kanu ikhwan al-shayateen. Where Allah Ta'ala says that those that uh, waste, they are the brothers of the devil. And Allah Ta'ala says, Inna al-musrifeen, those wala tusrifu. Do not waste your wealth. You know, someone was spending a lot of wealth in good. In good. So someone made a comment and he said, La israf fil khair. La khaira fil israf. There is no good in extravagance. There is no good in extravagance. So that person replied by saying, Correct, la israf fil khair. You are correct in what you said, that there is no good in extravagance. At the same time, there is no extravagance in matters of good. On the occasion of Tabuk, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu gave everything. There is not extravagant, but rather that is desired. In the same way, while we are encouraged to spend in good, there are two times where we are discouraged. One is Israf and Tabdeer. Israf means to spend more than what is necessary in legitimate and lawful things. And Tabdeer means to spend in Haram. If a person spends even a cent in Haram, it is Tabdeer because it is abusing the wealth. And many, you know, many more things can be said. So I think the answer is quite clear that in the event where the wealth has been abused, then uh, of course it would not be correct to, to give that wealth forward. Uh, I'll just end with the last question here. What age is a Muslim female supposed to don the hijab? Uh, we know as Muslims a person becomes mukallaf, where the laws of sharia ah become applicable to him or her, where salah becomes compulsory, discharging of zakah uh, for a male to observe his salah, etc., is when he physically matures. At the point of physical maturity, uh, this is the time where it becomes compulsory, mandatory, obligatory. But as is the pattern of the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he exhorts, we discipline our children from an earlier age so that they become routine. You know, a, a person would first do a thing uh, because of pressure. A child at the age of seven is going to perform salah, not out of the virtue or the sweetness or the love of salah, but out of the sheer pressure of his father. It would then become routine in his life. If he does it from seven to 10, from 10 to 12 or 13, he'll do it because for the last three years he's been performing salah. Hence, he performs it out of routine and habitual. And then after that, inshallah, the element of spirituality enters into him. We're conscious of his obligation to his creator. He's been performing for the last five years, conscious of the implications of salah, of the stern warnings of neglect in salah, etc. Likewise, a sister, uh, you know, she should don the hijab, it would be obligatory upon her at the time that if she physically matures. But of course, we would encourage her when we see today such young girls, you know, displaying fashion and also, uh, you know, uh, in, 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 in manners that are semi-nude, which is uh, reflecting an image of immorality at a very young and tender age. So let us not consider any age to be too young to impress upon them. Al-ilmu fi sighrik and naqshi fil hajar. Knowledge in childhood is like engraving something on a stone. So it would be compulsory at physical maturity, but it definitely would be encouraged at a much earlier age. Uh, that were basically the few questions that were asked. Inshallah, Sheikh Riyadh would continue. Uh, again, in kana sawaban fa min Allah. وَإِن كَانَ خَطَأً فَمِنِّي وَمِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ وَاللَّهُ هُوَ رَسُولُهُ مِنْهُ بَرِيْآنِ That if what was said was correct, which conformed with the desire of Allah and His Rasul, then it is from Allah. وَإِن كَانَ خَطَأً And if it was a mistake, definitely not deliberate. فَمِنِّي وَمِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ Then that was from my side and from the devil. وَاللَّهُ هُوَ رَسُولُهُ مِنْهُ بَرِيْآنِ And Allah and His exalted Nabi both are free from that particular version which was not in conformance with uh, the teachings of Rasulullah